We'll sing verses 1 and verse 3. It should be up on the screen as well. Christ the Lord is risen. Good morning, church family. It's good to be together this beautiful Sunday morning. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. There's a card in the pew rack in front of you. We would love to have you fill that out and put it in the offering bag when it comes by so we can get to know you and give you more information about grace. If you take a look at your bulletin, there are some upcoming events that you need to be aware of. Seniors, mark your calendars for our monthly Maranatha potluck. This Wednesday, April 17th at 11.30 a.m., they will be having a potluck lunch, encouragement from God's word, singing, and a great time of fellowship. We'll meet in the Maranatha room downstairs. Family, if you're 18 years old, a citizen of the United States, a resident of Idaho, you can register to vote. In the back of the sanctuary, and the Fellowship Hall, there are Idaho voter registration forms. We can encourage you to vote. And Dave Duran has applied for membership here at Grace Bible Church. The elders have voted to approve his membership and plan to welcome him into fellowship next Sunday morning. Please see your bulletin insert for his testimony of salvation and baptism. Men, mark your calendars for Saturday, uh, April 27th at 7 a.m. for our men's breakfast. This will be a hearty breakfast, a time in God's word, and fellowship. Come join us. Please sign up in the back or through the weekly email. We are planning a child dedication on Sunday, April 28th during the morning service. If you'd like your child to be dedicated at that time, please see Pastor Paul for details. Our annual ministry meeting is scheduled for Sunday, April 28th at 2 p.m. We'll be having an all-church potluck before that meeting at 1 p.m. Members, check your box is in the foyer for the agenda. All are welcome. Members are expected. Please pray for the Sullivan family, Wendy, Naomi, and Charlie. They are on a mission trip in until April 17th. They will be gone. Oh, they'll be back. April 17th. Please continue to pray for them and encourage them. We have an updated, we have an updated our missionary board in the back of the sanctuary. Please take a look at the missionaries you are supporting and where they're from. Vacation Bible School is coming. You can now register your children and you can also sign up to volunteer. Just go to our church website and click on VBS 2024 for more information. The dates for VBS are July 29th through August 2nd from 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Charles Vergeer and Hannah Geddes will be married in a small wedding this month. And if you would like to invite you to an open house on Saturday, May 11th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Geddes home. Please see your bulletin for the details. Thank you. Did you get all those? 
I want to begin this morning with a verse from Proverbs chapter 29. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bears rule, the people mourn. That uh, fits not only our country today, but also fits uh, where we're going in the book of Galatians this morning. So, I want to pray this morning for several people. In keeping with that uh, verse, I'd like us to pray for Mike Johnson, who's the Speaker of the House, and for Chuck Schumer, who's in charge of the U.S. Senate, the majority leader there. Um, I would like to pray for something that on the surface seems impossible, and that is that our government come to some kind of unity. God is the God of the impossible, so we can pray him, uh, seek him for that. Uh, we're also praying today for several who are on the sick list. Uh, John Bursick is recovering from back surgery. Wilder Osborne is doing better in the hospital over in Spokane. Uh, he's, I believe he's getting ready to come home. Uh, Roger and Dinah Ray uh, suffering with cancer. Stephen Kate, uh, he's had one treatment. He's looking for another treatment, another uh, protocol. So let's pray about that. And then Andy uh, Osborne with his neuro neurological situation. Let's also pray for the Sullivans as they're in Uganda. They're finishing up this week and be home on Wednesday. Let's also pray for Israel and the Middle East. I don't know if you all heard that Iran has attacked Israel with drones uh, as of last night. Uh, so things are heating up there and it's something we should be praying for. And then the last is we had a wedding yesterday. I don't know if you go to a wedding. I mean, when, you, when you go to a wedding, I don't know if you pray for the couple afterward for the next few days, weeks, as they go on their honeymoon and get acquainted with each other, get adjusted to life together. That's a good thing to pray about. So let's pray for these this morning. We're also praying for uh, Rathdrum Bible Church and our brothers and sisters there. So that's a lot. But would you join me as we pray? Father, we, we read this verse about how much better we are off when the righteous are in authority. And Lord, we pray that you would bring that to pass here in our country. We realize we have a responsibility to vote in order to enable that. We also have a responsibility to pray. And so we pray today for Speaker Johnson and for uh, Leader Schumer, Lord, that these men in their respective roles would find ways to bring peace instead of further division in our government. We pray for the ones who are sick, for John, for uh, Wilder, for Dinah Ray, for Steve and Kate, and for Andy. Lord, you know their specific needs, and we ask that you would meet them. We pray that you bless the Sullivans as they wrap up their ministry and head home this week. We pray for uh, Justice and Gracie as they begin their honeymoon today. And then we pray, Lord, for Israel and the whole Middle East. Lord, we understand from your word that things will get very bad over there. We don't know if this is what is happening now or if this is just a precursor. But Lord, we pray that you give wisdom to the leaders of Israel, wisdom to the leaders of the countries around, that you would bring a peace there and, a, and, a, and an understanding of what to do. And for our own country as we understand how to react to this situation as well. Lord, these are all huge things. We come to you as the God of the miraculous, the God of the impossible. And so we pray that you would minister in each of these situations. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Rathrum at Rathrum Bible Church. Lord, would you bless them in sharing the word there this morning. And then we pray for ourselves, that as we meet here together this morning, you will bless us, encourage us, teach us, and, um, receive our worship as we uh, worship together here. In the name of Christ, amen. All right, Chris will come and lead us in singing. 
So as we learn about the enemies of the gospel of grace, we find that many of them are within the church or the church leadership. And Peter and John certainly found this out in Acts chapter 4 where they uh, were called into question for doing the work of, that God had given them to do. And Peter, he says, You rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of, of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We're going to sing now a song that's not in our hymnals, unfortunately. But it's no other name but the name of Jesus. If you don't know it, listen. I'll do my best to sing it. It's pretty easy to catch. And if you do know it, sing out. Let's stand. No other name. How many of you have sung that before? Wow, about five. Good. You guys sing good. You caught on well. Let's turn now to number 672, 672 in your hymnal. Once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. God gives you a choice to decide here. And I really, even if you don't sing it, if you just meditate on the words here, you need to think about the cost of serving Jesus. You might be crucified with him. He said, take up, if any man would follow me, would come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. In today's terms, that might be like take up your electric chair. No, I'm serious. It's going to come to that someday. Have you decided to follow Jesus at all costs? Let's sing once to every man and nation. Meditate on the words as we sing this. Once to
men. We just read a book this week, my family and I, um, about martyrs in Spain, uh, um, those who were taking the Reformed tradition versus uh, and, and being persecuted by the Catholic uh, powers that be. It's rather sobering when you think about all of that, but actually we probably should count the cost. And, and so just want to encourage you Make sure you know the Lord and make sure that you're not just playing a game. Let's turn to Numbers 474. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. These people left their lives, their fortunes, their sacred honor. Some of them had it forcibly taken away. Some of them left, walked away from it all to escape. I wonder if we would do the same. Men, I would really love it if you sing verse 2 together, and then we'll all come back in on the chorus.
Lord God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, we cannot take credit for that. That is something that you have done. You've opened our eyes. You've opened our hearts. And we give you the glory for that. Lord, we ask now that you would help us to be bold and to be um, just completely sold out and and to remember that there is no other name and there is no other thing under heaven by which men might be saved but the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for bringing us that salvation and revealing it. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be faithful in sharing that with others. Lord, and if there's somebody in this room today or somebody that can hear my voice, whether they're watching online or whatever, Father, I pray if they need to know you today, that you would reveal yourself to them even like you did to us. And that they would be humble enough to come and ask of the hope that lies within us, the reason why we sing. Lord, we just commit the rest of this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please make each other welcome.
I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Joined hands with Jesus as we travel this song. Form part of the family, the family of God. Morning, folks. Uh, we're going to start by praying for our missionaries. Today we have Avant Ministries, uh, Compassion Evangelical Hospital, and Friends of Israel. Um, just mentioned, I have some friends in Israel with their missionaries there. Their children serve in the IDF, so that's an interesting position to be in right now. Um, I think it's important to remember that Israel is not saved, and in fact, Paul said that for the gospel, they are enemies for our sake, the Jewish people, and yet they are beloved because they're elect of God. So we love the Jewish people, but they're, uh, and we desire to share the gospel with them, but uh, they're not necessarily our friends, and I lived there for a while, and they don't, uh, they don't necessarily like Christians. In fact, they have laws against sharing your faith with people in Israel. So we pray for them, and... Uh, we love them and we want to support them, but we support them in truth. So let us pray. Lord, we pray for Avant Ministries that they would have wisdom and clever good ideas on how to best get the truth of God's word out through radio broadcast to those who are listening across North Africa. We pray for Compassion Evangelical Hospital, that the hospital staff would be united and work well together we ask that you would give wisdom to the individuals within that organization to do their everyday jobs well and guide their hands in skill and excellence as they perform medical care. And we thank you, Lord, for the lives that have been helped and changed for the better, both physically and spiritually, through this organization. We ask that you would cause the individuals in the Friends of Israel ministry to present the whole truth of the gospel clearly to the Jewish people and we ask that you would give clarity of mind to all the individuals represented in working within these ministries that we have prayed for. And we pray for us as well, that you would guide us to be intentional about understanding the things we profess to believe and help us in remaining humble, repentant, and conforming our everyday actions to the truth. We ask that our living would be conducted in integrity and that we would always be ready to give an answer to anyone about the hope that is within us. We're grateful for the opportunity, Lord, to give back a portion of what you have blessed us with financially, and we ask you that this money would be responsibly used for your glory and for your kingdom. Amen.
What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. From all alarms Leaning 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 on The everlasting arms Oh, how sweet to walk In this pilgrim way Leaning on everlasting arms oh how bright the path grows from day to day leaning on the everlasting arms leaning leaning safe and secure from all Everlasting arms What have I to dread What have I to fear Leaning on The everlasting arms I have blessed peace With my Lord so near Leaning on The everlasting Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting. From all alarms Leaning 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 on The everlasting arms Nice music. Boy, our culture uh, really needs something more sure to lean upon than just uh, its own experience. I'm sure thankful that we have the Word of God and truth larger and more enduring than our own lifespan and experience to understand the world with which we live and how we're supposed to how we're supposed to live. Let us stand together for the scripture reading. It's in Acts chapter 20. Verses 28 through 31. That is page 965 through 966. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. Let's read together. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember, by the space of three years I ceased not to warn everyone 
night and day with tears. All right. Thank you. You may be seated. Appreciate the emphasis we've had already this morning on standing firm on the word of God, standing firm on the gospel. And the book of Galatians is written entirely for that purpose. In the middle of the book of Galatians, where we are this morning, we also find something about leadership, find something about the uh, way that we should respond to leaders within the church. And so there's a a painful element in our text for this morning. So children, I have a story for you. glad that Jesus loves even you. You know, I'm looking around and I'm seeing how quick you children are growing up. Well, I have a story for this morning that's a little bit sad. There was a girl in Sunday school in her church named Julia. And when she came to the church six years ago and started attending Sunday school, she met a little girl named Angela who was the same age and they became very good friends. They talked about lots of things, but one of the things they loved to talk about was Jesus. They would talk about the Sunday school lesson. They would talk about the verses they were memorizing. They would talk about things that they prayed about. They just loved to have conversations about Jesus. And this is where the sad part of the story is. One day, Julia and her family took a long vacation, a whole month long, and they were traveling to different parts of the country. And Julia knew she was gonna miss Angela very much, and so she asked her mom, Mom, can I use your cell phone to call Angela every day while we're gone? And mom says, yes, that would be fine. And so every day, she called Angela. And they would talk about things about Jesus, about things they had seen on the trip and everything. And then one day, about halfway through their trip, when Julia called Angela, Angela didn't want to talk to her. And she thought, what's going on? She tried again the next day. Angela still didn't want to talk to her. And the next day, and Angela still didn't want to talk to her. And then she found out from another friend in in her Sunday school class that Angela was now being best friends with Rosie. Now, Rosie wasn't the same kind of girl as Josie. She liked to talk, but she liked to talk about toys and clothes and maybe even boys sometimes. She didn't like to talk about Jesus. And so Josie was very concerned, or excuse me, Julia, I forgot her name. Julia was very concerned that Angela might be 
moved away from God because of the, the friendship she was having. And so she asked her mom, would it be all right with you if I sent Angela a long text? Would you help me write a text that would, I could send to her to hopefully turn her back to Jesus instead of to this friend that wasn't very good for her? Her mom said yes. Now, the question would be this, what would Julia write? And I'm not gonna answer that for you. But I want you to listen carefully to our scripture text this morning and you'll find out what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians when the same thing was happening. Okay, you listen carefully. Thank you. series we're in is called Guarding the Gospel of Grace. If you're new with us this morning, I welcome you to think about that subject. The Gospel of Grace is the New Testament version of how we come to the Lord. It was present in the Old Testament, but it was sort of clouded over by the Old Testament law. And this morning, We've spent a lot of time thinking about the truth of the gospel, how we need to stand on the gospel. I was having a conversation yesterday with one of the young men in the congregation who says there's a bunch of Daniels in our congregation right now. And I was encouraging him with them to dare to be a Daniel. And of course, it doesn't have to be your name to be Daniel before you can do that. But one of the things that happened in Galatia, in relationship to Paul, is a question about leadership. The Lord Jesus, as he gave us the gospel, and as he presented the truth of the Bible, taught us that leaders are important. They're important in business, they're important in families, but particularly they're important in church. Here's just a few verses I picked out that I'm not gonna take time to read them all. I'll just give you a little summation, but this is God's plan for leaders. In Acts chapter 15, verses five and six, we have leaders after a big conference about the circumcision and the law and everything, the same question that we have in the book of Galatians. The leaders were the ones that solved the problem. In Acts 14, verse 23, Paul had uh, brought people to the Lord in several different churches, established several different churches, and he came back and he ordained elders. He set up leadership in each of those churches. In Acts 20, verse 28, which we just read, Kevin led us in that reading, leaders were overseeing the flock. And, And God said, it's really important because I paid for these people in your church with my own blood. 1 Thessalonians 5, 12, and 13. I want to read that one for you. It says that we're to honor our leaders and get to know them. It says, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1, we have the office of a bishop or an elder in the local church and all the criteria by which we select those. We'll be doing some of that in two weeks here. Titus 1 verse 5, Paul tells Titus to ordain elders in every city. So leadership is very important for the functioning of a body of believers like ours. But God also tells us that there's the possibility of a leader pulling people away to follow him or leaders pulling people away to follow them. And that's exactly what's happening in the book of Galatia. I want to share with you that there's two men in the Bible 
that uh, if you'd go to the book of First or Third John, I put chapter one up there, but there's only one chapter, so it's Third John, and starting with verse nine. I want to read about two men in the church. Their letter, their names both start with D, just like Daniel. One of them is doing a bad job of leadership, and one of them is doing a good job of leadership. So here's what the Apostle John wrote. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Now notice, John, who was probably the one who... who uh, established this church, writes to one of the men who's now a leader in the church, and that leader won't even accept the, uh, the letter. Verse 10, he says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither does he himself receive the brethren, and forbids them that would, and cast them out of the church." So John says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that does good is of God, and he that does evil hath not seen God. Then we come to the second man whose name begins with D. His name is Demetrius. Demetrius has a good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. So here we have a single body of believers with two men who are leaders there, one of them doing what is right, another one doing what is wrong. We just read one of God's warnings about leaders together. It says, some will draw away disciples after them from your own group. So we're talking about not people necessarily coming in from the outside, but inside. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 11, and three, verse three, talks about contentions over leaders. So as we look at our text in Galatians 4 this morning, we're going to see the heart of a leader and how that heart responds when things are going wrong. The leadership is, is moving against him. So just a reminder, we're in chapters 3 and 4, the center part of the book of Galatians, the gospel of grace explained. The Lord willing, we'll finish chapter 4 tomorrow or next week. But I want you to read with me, or to listen as I read along in Galatians chapter 4, 11 through 20. Verse 11 we finished up with last week. But let's be, go to the Lord before we read this. Father, as we look at your word this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts to your truth. May we be the kind of leaders, may we the, be the kind of followers that would avoid the situation we see here in Galatia. And so, Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to this truth this morning. In the name of Christ, amen. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 11. Paul says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I think he actually, in our way we'd say it today, I'm afraid for you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, or testing, which was in my flesh, ye despised not nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness ye spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Do you hear Paul's heart? Do you hear Paul's pain as he writes to these people? He's like Julia, who's 
friend Angela has turned away to another friend, a friend that's not nearly so good as the, the friend that Julia could be, and Paul is agonizing over this. In, in chapters three and four, well, actually in the whole book, he's using several different ways to get the, the people in Galatia to turn back to the truth. Sometimes he's using logical argument. Sometimes he's using uh, strong words. And here, he's using emotion. He's using his own personal response to the situation to describe what's going on. Uh, before we go there, let me explain something that maybe you have observed and maybe not. Paul is being very, very severe as he writes to the Galatians. Chapter one, he says, anybody who preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. In chapter five, he will say, if you follow this wrong gospel, you're gonna be fallen from grace. And we'll talk about that phrase when we get there, some misunderstandings there. He, he even says at one point, I wish that the people that are doing this to you would even be cut off themselves. Paul is not mincing words in this book. And as I was preparing this week, I was comparing that to Philippians chapter one. Paul is in prison and he's got some people who are trying to make things worse for him. But here's what he said. Many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and, therein, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Now that's a whole different attitude. People are preaching to try to make things worse for him, but his response is, I'm rejoicing. What's the difference? In Philippians, the gospel is being preached. In Galatians, a false gospel is being preached. So in, Gal in Philippians, a a, the true gospel is being preached with wrong motives. In Galatians, the false gospel is being preached. And so Paul reacts entirely differently to that. Okay, so if we were to divide this section the way I've, as I've studied it, I find three things here. First of all, false leaders drive wedges with godly leaders. Secondly, false leaders steal hearts from godly leaders. And finally, false leaders cause pain to godly leaders. If you look at this first section, verses uh, 12 through 16, he says, Brethren, I beseech you be as I am, for I am, not a, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. He's saying, there's a problem here, but it's not a problem strictly that's my problem. It's something bigger than that. And then he talks about how he preached the gospel. We'll come back to that in a minute. But then notice, the, he, if you read kind of between the lines, but using these phrases that I've underlined, he says, where, in the, where, where is then the blessedness you spake of? What's happened to the friendly words we used to have between ourselves? What's happened to those compliments you used to give me? What's, what's happened to the, the, the joy you had in the gospel when I preached it to you? What happened to that? Well, so something has happened. It doesn't define it here, but something has happened. Then in verse 16, he says, am I therefore become your enemy? You see those leaders that have come into the church who are preaching the gospel of the circumcision, preaching the gospel that you have to obey God's Old Testament law to be a believer as a Gentile, they have to overcome something in order to get their message across. They have to overcome the Apostle Paul. They have to overcome the gospel that he taught them first. So, I've used the term that they drive wedges. What we see here in this first section is how the Galatians honored Paul before, before Paul had to write this letter. How did they honor him before? Notice it says, verse 13, I know, ye know how that through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. 
How did Paul get to the Galatians in the first place? We don't know any details, but apparently he had a physical impairment that got him in touch with the Galatians to begin with. He says, I preached the gospel to you at the first through infirmity of the flesh. Now, we don't know what that infirmity is, but the next verse, uh, uh, not not the next verse, uh, verse uh, 15, maybe gives us a clue. Paul may have had an eye problem, not an eye problem like pride, I mean with his physical eyes. And he preached, he didn't care about the infirmity, but he preached the gospel to them, and they had a reaction to him as he preached. He says, my temptation or my testing, which was in my flesh, this infirmity that he's talking about, you didn't despise it, you didn't reject it, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. So, I don't know whether it was hard to look at him because of the eye problem, I don't know if he was suffering pain, but their reaction was to receive the the gospel that Paul presented to them with great joy and to honor the man who had brought it even though there was something wrong in his body. This could also be the thorn in the flesh that he talks about in 2 Corinthians Corinthians 7, 12, when he says, I prayed God three times to have this thorn in the flesh removed And God says, no, I'm going to leave it with you because my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Maybe. Well, why do we think it might have been an eye problem? Because in verse 15, he says, where is this, where is then the blessedness he spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Every now and then we read in the newspaper about someone who gives a kidney to someone else because they need one, a kidney transplant. Paul says, you Galatians were willing to give me an eye transplant. Even if you had to lose one of your eyes to give me a good eye, you would have been willing to do that if it simply had been medically possible. Wow. That's quite a reaction, isn't it? That's why he calls it a blessedness. That's how they honored him at first. They received him as he was, and they would have sacrificed from their own bodies in order to help him. But now, if we read between the lines, we realize that's no longer true. He says, where is then the blessedness you spoke of? Apparently, that blessedness, that warm response to Paul has disappeared. It's like Julia making phone calls to Angela and not getting her to want to speak to him. And then he says, Have, am I therefore become your enemy? Well, who's calling him an enemy? Well, it's the Galatians. Their hearts have been turned away from Paul to the point that they're now considering him to have given them a false gospel and he is, they're now considering him to be an enemy, or at least he's imagining that. That's not where it stops. False leaders also steal hearts. You remember how Absalom stole the hearts of the Israelites from his father David and started a a insurrection against him of rebellion. There's a word in the next two verses, verses 17 and 18, that I want you to notice. It says, they zealously affect you, but not well. Yes, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously afflicted always in a good thing and not only when I am present with you. That word affect or zealously affect means to be emotionally involved, to be emotionally responsive. So he said, they are coming in, to put it in modern terms, making friends with you, acting like they're on your side, acting like they're, they're the best thing, the best kind of friend they could be to you. But what they're after is your response, emotional response to them. They're zealously affecting you and they would exclude you. That's you're going to take me away from me, but that ye might affect them. 
And he says, it's good to be zealously affected. It's good to be emotionally involved in the gospel. It's good to be uh, striving after the right things. But don't do it just when I'm there. Do it even when I'm absent from you. Well, how do false leaders steal hearts? Well, we, the first thing we see in verse 17 is that they are pressuring the Galatians. That word effect has an idea of, of emotional pressure, emotional drawing. They pressured the Galatians two things, to forsake Paul and to honor them, to follow them. That's true in a lot of different areas of life. If people's hearts are turned one direction, you want them to go over here, you have to ruin whatever they're affected to in order that you can replace that. So they were pressuring the Galatians to forsake Paul and to follow them. And then it says they diverted them. What did they divert them from? They diverted them from being zealously affected in a good thing. While the Galatians were turning their hearts from Paul to the, to the false leaders, they were losing something that Paul wanted them to have. He wanted them to be wholeheartedly, zealously affected in, this, in, the, in the gospel they had first heard. There's one final thing they do, at least in this passage, and that's that they cause pain to godly leaders. Godly leaders are humble. Godly leaders love people. Godly leaders want what's best for the group that they're ministering to. They are servant leaders as we read it in the Bible. False leaders, on the other hand, are proud. They're self-centered. They want not what's good for the people, but what's good for themselves. And that's what's coming out in verses 17 and 18. And so Paul now begins to express what he's feeling as this is all going on. He says, my little children, by the way, little children means children that are still immature and need training. He calls them brethren up in verse 12. And here he calls them little children. Those are both very emotionally good words. They're, they're words of relationship. But he says, my little children, of whom I travail in birth again. Now, you ladies know what he's talking about. You mothers know what he's talking about. Travail in birth means to give birth to someone, and through the pain of that birth, you get a child. He says, I travail in birth again. What's he mean? Well, when he was there and he was preaching the gospel to them, he spiritually gave birth to them through a great deal of agony on his own part, maybe the physical thing and also spiritually, to get them to follow the gospel. And now he feels like he has to do it again. How would you ladies, you mothers, like it? if you had to give birth twice to the same child. That's, it. That's the, the word picture he's creating here. I had to do it once, and now I feel like I have to do it all over again, I have to go through the same process to get you away from, first it was from paganism to the gospel, and now it's from a false gospel to the gospel. Notice the emotion in that. He says, I travail a birth again until Christ be formed in you. He wants them to look like Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, a verse we have chosen as leaders here to be kind of a theme verse for the ministry, it says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. We as elders here want you to grow into maturity in Jesus Christ. And we're willing to do whatever we can do to um, see that to happen. 
Notice again, as he goes on in verse 28, or excuse me, verse 20, he says, I desire, again, he's talking emotionally, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice. How many times have you as a parent wished that you could talk comfortably to your children, but they have just disobeyed and you have to speak to them about their disobedience. You have to use some hard words with them. You may have to give them a discipline. You don't want that. You'd rather bless your children for doing what is right. He said, I wish I could change my voice for I stand in doubt of you. I just can't figure out what's going on. I don't, I'm, I'm just concerned and worried and, frust- and, and concerned that you're going the wrong direction and I wish I didn't have to write this letter. I wish I could write a letter like the book of Philippians where it's full of rejoicing and joy. Instead, I'm having to write this letter that's full of, of the agony of trying to get you away from the false gospel. Paul felt the pain of their defection from his gospel to the other gospel, and which ultimately was a defection from him to these other leaders. He had once given birth to them spiritually, now he has to do it over again. And he was in doubt about their loyalty. He wanted to be with them in person. He wanted to speak differently with them, but it doesn't work. This is the Galatians and the Apostle Paul and false leaders. Now, let's apply that to ourselves. We are part of a body, and we need to be careful that we don't do the same thing that these Galatians are doing as a result of what's been given. So, first thing I would like to recommend is that you review your own life and repent of any way you have been involved in encouraging disunity within the body. We have just been through a year and a half of very difficult time here in our church, and there have been lots of opportunities for that to happen. Also review and repent of any way, you have been been encouraged toward disunity by someone else. So either you were the encourager or you were the encouragee. Think through your life and and, uh, check that out. First thing I would like to say is that if there's a concern, come to the leaders with those concerns, with those questions, or with those disagreements. It's very common that I either hear uh, by um, hearsay or maybe I'm involved in a conversation myself in which people have concerns and yet they're going to everybody except the people they should go to. Don't hide behind the excuse that your leaders are unapproachable. I know the men who lead this congregation, and they are approachable. We've just had several men's meetings to sit down with you men and talk through some things that are going on here in the church in terms of leadership and and, uh, the way we're organized and so on like that. And we've, at least our attempt has been to be very approachable. I'm talking here not only about what's going on here, but what goes on in congregations like this around the world. Satan loves to divide. God loves to unite. Another thing that's pretty big is don't jump to conclusions. I don't know if you heard about the lady who only, the only exercise she ever got was jumping to conclusions. This is so, such a big area that as I was preparing this, I thought I can think of dozens of examples in my own life where I have done that. It is so easy. In fact, I was talking to a brother just during the greeting time today. He noticed that at the wedding yesterday, I don't know if, if you were not there, as they, as they came to the time for the kiss, the best man and the maid of honor each had a canister full of confetti and they popped that and confetti rained down all over the couple as they were kissing. Well, he noticed that I stepped back just before the kiss. 
So he came to a conclusion. I knew what was going to happen about the confetti, and I wanted to get out of the way. Right fact, wrong conclusion. We're going to talk about that in just here a little bit. I stepped back out of the way because the photographer said, I don't want you in the picture when I take the picture of the kiss. And it is so easy to observe something. And we'll, uh, let me just walk through the process here. I, I have experienced this. I've done this so many times. I know exactly how it works. Uh, these things are all in my hall of shame. But I've done this dozens and dozens of times. You see or hear something. Now you have a fact. And it's a true fact. You saw or heard something. In that case, he saw me step back. That's the fact he saw. You interpret those facts. And this is where we begin to get into trouble. You say, I saw it or I heard it, and now I'm going to interpret it as to why that happened. And so he interprets those facts. Then, in many cases, you speak about those facts to someone else. And then something very common happens. Very sad, but very common. The other person adds his own facts. He has seen or heard something that seems to match what you've seen or heard, and he's now going to, he now shares that with you. Now, the other person also has interpreted those facts that he's adding to the conversation. And those new facts seem to confirm your interpretation. You both agree to the interpretation. And sometimes others get involved the same way. And pretty soon, you have a complete misunderstanding of what's going on because of the wrong interpretations of the facts. I appreciated Alex sharing uh, when he spoke two weeks ago about the fact that happened with him and, my, and me. He sent me an email. That's a fact. I didn't answer it. That's a fact. He sent me another email. That was a, another fact. I didn't answer that one either. There's a, third, a fourth fact. He, I think he sent me another one, and I didn't answer that. We've got six facts all lined up. And he began to wonder, as he shared with you, he began to wonder if I didn't care about him. That's an interpretation. Probably the first time it happened, he just thought, oh, Paul's busy. You know, he's got lots on, on his plate. He'll get back to me eventually. But when he tried the second and third time, he made an interpretation of those facts. And if, if we hadn't gotten together and figured that out, we could have had a problem. Now, I want to share with you that what I just described happens in the Bible too. There's two very interesting stories in the book of, uh, in, uh, related to the Old Testament. What I have here on the screen is a map of the way the territory of Israel was divided up among the 12 tribes. I'm going to draw a red line down through the middle there, right across, right down the Jordan River. And you'll see that there's two and a half tribes on this side of the line and nine and a half tribes on this side of the line. In Numbers 32, if, if you remember, they came in and they conquered the land on this side, Sihon and Og, uh, the kings of the Amorites, they conquered their territory and took over their land. And then the, the other nine and a half tribes got their uh, um, land on the other side. Well, in, in Numbers 32, we have an individual misunderstanding. That's not so bad as it could be, but that's an individual understanding. The men, the, the soldiers who were, who were going to take territory on this side said, we would like to have our land here and not have our land over on the other side. Oh, we'll let the rest of the tribes have all that land. We've got sheep and goats and cattle, and this is a great land for livestock. Moses didn't ask them what they meant. He jumped to a conclusion. And he went on, if you read verse number 32, he went on for several verses scolding them for letting all the tribes attack this territory and win it, but now they're not going to go across and help them attack the rest of the nation. And after Moses got done with his little tirade, his little scolding, they said, oh, that's not what we meant. 
we're going to build cities and sheepfolds for our, our animals here. And then, but the soldiers of us are going to go across and we won't come back until the land has been entirely conquered. And then Moses gave his blessing. Well, that wasn't the end of it. In Joshua 22, now we have a group misunderstanding because when that finally, the land was all conquered and those two and a half tribes started going back to the other side, they built an altar on the, ba- on the, ba- on the east bank of the Jordan River. That's a fact. What was the interpretation of the fact? They're going after false gods. They're building their own idol, their their own altar. They're not going to come back and worship with us wherever God puts the tabernacle. And so they actually talked it among themselves enough that all nine and a half tribes, well, ten and a half, you count Levi, all ten and a half tribes gathered to go to battle against the two and a half tribes on this side. They were going to wipe them out. Fortunately, they sent Eliezer, the priest, with some men to, to initial delegation, and they said, oh, no, we were concerned that this Jordan River might look like a barrier between the two of us, so we put an altar. It's not an altar for sacrifice. It's an altar of witness so that you remember that we belong with you too. Isn't that crazy? We could do this another way. Let's just use some, some math numbers. You see or hear something and you assume that's a two, when actually it was a one. And then the other person sees or hears something and he thinks it's a two, but actually it was a five. So the two of you have your conversation. You come up with an interpreted total, which is four. Two and two always means four, right? I've even heard this used as, well, I saw the facts. Two and two always means four. Well, no. In this case, it means six. Because you saw a one and thought it was a two. You saw a five and thought it was a two. The actual total is six. Related to this is our second area, and that's to avoid gossip about leaders. And let me just define, since we're almost out of time, let me just define gossip very simply. It's when you're discussing problems with those who are not part of the problem or part of the solution. Gossip is probably the greatest sin in the Christian church. We all fall prey to it. It's very easy. Sometimes we have to say, don't tell me that. Sometimes we have to take it and say, well, okay, what do we do with that? But gossip usually doesn't involve the person you're talking about. And so that goes with number one, to come come to leadership if there's a question. If only the Galatians had written Paul about this new teaching. If they'd said, Paul told us the gospel, this sounds a little weird. Let's write a letter to the apostle Paul and ask, tell him what we're hearing and ask him what he thinks about this. Oh, the story would have been so different. Um, If only the Galatians had trusted the care that Paul had shown when he was with them. They could go back and say, remember how he pushed through to share the gospel with us? Remember how he, he sacrificed himself and, and he was we, we just appreciated him so much? If they'd only remembered that when people were trying to drive these wedges. And finally, if the Galatians had only seen through the division that these new leaders were bringing about. When someone is causing division, it's almost, well, it's always wrong unless the division is over something very, very important. Well, let's just wrap up with this. Psalm 133 verses 1 and 3 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. God desires for everybody, ours, the other churches we pray for, churches across the, the nation, across the world, he desires that they be in unity. We have to be careful that we are preserving that unity and not destroying it. I didn't bring this up because there's anything particularly going on right now in our body. I brought it up because this text tells us about that problem. 
And so it's just a good time to remind ourselves at any point in our history as a church that leaders are designed by God to lead toward unity. If there's questions, now leaders can go wrong. We obviously see that in Scripture. But if they do, go to them and talk to them about it. Figure out what's going on. You may find out that you have misinterpreted what you're seeing. So I want this passage, even though it's it's a little bit of a, a parenthesis in all that Paul is concerned about with the Galatians, we're not talking here about the gospel itself. We're talking about how leaders are, how lead and, and how we should respond to them. But let's make sure that here at Grace, we are preserving unity in all that we do. That that's a drive, that that's a passion we have. That if something seems wrong, go check it out. Don't just interpret what you're seeing in your own mind and letting it, um, and, and maybe missing the boat entirely. I'm going to close in prayer, and then we want to sing a song called Come All Christians, be committed. And there's some things in those, the wording of that song that will reflect what's going on here. Father, this is an important lesson for us to learn. It's a little hard for a leader to share it. And yet the Apostle Paul did that. I pray that each of us, that you would work in our own hearts to know if we have been involved in any way to discredit the body here. We also need to know this for the future because this will come up again and again and again because we know our enemy loves to divide. We're seeing this in our own country. Satan has come into our country and a country that used to be joyful and united in many ways is now divided. Lord, we pray for our country and we pray for ourselves. We pray that the attitudes in our country will not infiltrate the church. That we might be a beacon of light in this community because they say, behold, how they love one another. Thank you, Father, for this reminder. Guide us as we apply it. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we turn to number 397, I just, uh, Paul, thank you for that, by the way. I appreciate that. Um, I have to say, I've been involved in too many of those conversations here and always justify it. Oh, it's, you know, I'm trying to do what's best trying to hear somebody out. Would you forgive me? Would you forgive me? Forgive you, brother. Thanks. Appreciate it. I love you all, and I want what's best for this congregation. We have gone through some very difficult times in these last couple of years. But we've got to support what God has given us. Not a one of us have been perfected this side of glory. Let's stand and turn to number 397 and sing, Come all Christians, be committed to the service of the Lord. Make your lives for him more fitted. Tune your hearts with one accord. We sing after every communion service, blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. This is the desire of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We read about it in his word, and he said, um, right before he died, he, he prayed that we would be one, as he and the Father are one. Let's do exactly what Paul recommended and um, search our hearts. And let's... 
go forward with one accord as, mu as much as we can. Let's sing together. Come all Christians, be committed to the service of the Lord. Make your lives for Him more fitted to your hearts with one accord. Come into His courts with gladness, all your strength are renewed. Turn away from sin and sadness, transformed with life anew. Of your time and talents give now, they are gifts from God above. To be used by Christians freely, to proclaim His wondrous love. Come again to serve the Savior, as an offering with you bring. And your work with Christ on favor, and with joy His praises. Come in praise and adoration, all who on Christ and believe. Worship Him with consecration, praise and love you will receive. For His grace and grace and glory, for the Spirit and the Word. And repeat the gospel story until Amen. A couple of quick announcements. So I had to make an executive decision today. We're not going to um, end up doing the choir practice at two. So um, Jim Hollingsworth, you're, you're excused from that. Um, youth choir, however, will be directly following the service downstairs. And then for those of you who are on the pastoral search committee team, that will be directly following the service. Um, so the rest of you are dismissed. Please pray for us as we meet together to consider some pastoral candidates.